OK, so I'm going to talk about the custom function unit playground, CFU playground. And what's the custom function unit? It's just anything that you add to your CPU to add some special custom specialized functionality. And we'll talk, talk a lot about the details. Um, um, again, I'm Tim Callahan. This is uh, work with my colleague, Alan Green, um, who's also at Google. This is not an official Google project. Um, so Google is not guaranteeing support going forward. It is open source. So we are looking for contributors. Um, you can help uh, in many different ways, just trying it out, reporting bugs, uh, pointing out holes in the documentation. All that is very helpful. OK, here's the one slide overview of the whole talk. We're going to build a soft RISC-V CPU and then add your special functionality to it. But in the end, it's just Verilog RTL, um, which means you can put it on any FPGA. It's not tied to any particular feature from a particular vendor. Um, it's just RTL. And we're targeting tiny ML, uh, which is like inference only at the edge of usually quantized 8-bit data and with very constrained resources. Um, so the, the, the central point is we're going to start with the model that you want to execute and then specialize everything just for that model. And of course, you could always specialize the software aspect, but we're going to specialize both the TensorFlow libraries that execute it, but also customize the processor that they run on to uh, speed it up. And again, we're speeding up just that model. It's not a, a domain-specific accelerator. We're looking to speed up just the operations that are in the model that you care about. Um, the playground aspect is to make it really easy both to uh, set up and get going running, and then also very quick iterations. Uh, you know, rebuilding your software and hardware together, and is fully open source. Uh, so your the 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 effort that you invest in here, you won't be tied to any particular FPGA, uh, FPGA, FPGA vendor board, anything. You can take your RTL and put it on another board uh, or another part. If uh, there's a part shortage or there's a new part that comes out, you want to try out. Um, so that's another benefit, and. If, uh, the playground is really set up assuming you have a FPGA board, uh, large or small, uh, connected to your laptop right there on your desk as you're doing the development. So what would you use it for? Well, you can. this can be the end product. You can deploy your soft CPU plus your extensions for, for ML or, in fact, for non-ML uses, but we're focusing on ML. Uh, but you can deploy it. You might think you're giving up too much performance compared to a hard microcontroller. But the thing is, we, you can specialize the, the architecture exactly for what you're doing. So we, we find that it actually is competitive with a hard microcontroller that you can't specialize. Um, again, because your uh, IP is very portable to alternative FPGAs, there, there might be less uh, risk of part shortages. Um, and just really quickly, there's also a security benefit because you build the CPU, you know everything that's in there. Uh, so you know there's no back doors in your CPU, whereas if you're getting an off-the-shelf microcontroller, it's, very, it's much more difficult to guarantee uh, trustworthiness. Um, but you might also think of the your soft CPU plus Excel plus your special stuff as just a prototype that you're then going to take to ASIC. And that would be another use for this. Um, it's a great learning platform. You might learn in your classroom lectures a little bit about how certain TensorFlow operations execute. But believe me, once you get into the code and try to optimize it and build new instructions to speed it up, you're going to really understand that computation. And finally, for research in new directions and ML, a lot of times they're hindered by the fact you don't have hardware that supports your new ideas very well. This pl platform allows you to develop them in, in tandem, the new ML approaches plus the hardware to support it. Um, so again, I, I think it's really fun. I think at least when I took my undergraduate computer architecture class, I thought, this is so fun. I want to go out and build my own computer. And then 
in my grad school class, I realized computer architecture uh, is actually really hard and maybe not so much fun. Uh, it's really hard to satisfy all the constraints, uh, pick what features uh, are in, the, in your architecture, not in your architecture, so that they all work well together. Uh, what's your typical workload that you're optimizing for? What's the workload of the future? Uh, you have to be concerned about all that. Um, uh, even just risk five ISA extensions are, are very difficult to nail down and get everyone to agree on. Um, so the point is here, you kind of get all the fun parts of being a computer architect without the hard stuff because you're, you're, you and your group are the only stakeholders. You, you don't have to worry about satisfying a lot of other people. You don't have to worry about getting it ratified. Uh, you can think about it and really it's a disposable ISA if you, so just go ahead and do it. If you realize there's a better way, then do the better way. You're, you're, you're not committing to silicon and you're not committing to a spec that's going to last for 20 years. So anyway. Um, okay. And did I mention this open source? Everything from TensorFlow to the, the open ISA of RISC-V, the CPU implementation. Uh, currently, we support VexRisk because it came with the custom function unit interface that we use. Um, however, other, other open source RISC-V cores, there's many of them, uh, in, you know, including Surf. You, know, you, you could potentially add a CFU interface to any of them. Uh, we use Litex to build up the system around the CPU so that it connects to the outside world. And even the tool chain can be fully open. Uh, the, the team I work in is the SimFlow team at, at Google with Tim Ansel. Uh, you can use vendor tools if you wish. Um, so basically, the only proprietary part of the whole stack is the FPGA itself. OK, outline of the talk. I uh, need to get through it pretty fast. So uh, let's just dive in. Uh, once you hear someone. Probably a lot of you have done custom function units or coprocessors or accelerators. Um, so you probably want to like, what's, what's the details? Okay, so it's actually a fairly simple interface based on a RISC-V R format instruction currently. Um, we can certainly add an I format instruction, but right now in the playground, we're only supporting an R format instruction, which means we get two oper operands from the register file and uh, write back one result. Now, um, that seems very restrictive, but you can actually uh, abuse this interface quite a bit. And it, it's actually a lot more flexible than it sounds. Um, it can support not just single cycle operations, but multiple or even variable cycles because there's uh, handshaking at both sides. You can refuse a new instruction while it's working on something. So you can have pipelined or iterative computation. Uh, the, the, Key limitation is there's no direct connection from the CFU to the memory hierarchy, or even a memory port like some interfaces have where the CFU can say, hey, can you go load a value from memory for me? Um, it's simply the R format instructions, so to and from CPU registers. Uh, the CFU can contain state registers and even very somewhat large memories only limited by the physical resources on your FPGA. And kind of a nomenclature thing, the way we define it is there's always just one custom function unit, but it can have multiple custom instructions. They might be independent of each other or they might be cooperating. So, and different instructions can access the same state. Uh, it's up, totally up to the CFU designer what they put in there. Um, so graphically, this is what it looks like with a very simplified view of the CPU side, just showing the data paths involved in an R format instruction where you have the two bit fields that specify the source registers. You pull out the data from the register file, send it to the ALU, but now you can also send it to the custom function unit if when the op code is custom zero. And then you also send out 10 bits as the, the function or the sub op code for the custom function unit to operate on. And then the result comes back, it's fully integrated with the bypass network. So you could have back-to-back -back CFU, CPU instructions, that uh, directly forward the results to the next instruction. Um, oh, and the, 
the the pipeline control and CFU plugin, it looks like a barrier, but in fact, it's all soft. So once you flatten the design and throw it to the FPGA implementation tools, it all gets optimized and placed and routed together. So that if in the case where your CFU is very small, it basically gets sucked right into the CPU pipeline with, with very little uh, additional overhead. Um, I think I won't have to spend too much time convincing you that adding your own custom instructions to a CPU is a good uh, idea in a lot of cases. It's, it's especially useful in ML because it spends a lot of time in, inner, in, in loopness. And so if you can just speed up that innermost loop, that's where it spends a, a large fraction of the runtime. So with a little bit of hardware design to add your custom instruction, you can speed up a large fraction of the computation but still leave all the rest of the code in software where it's a lot easier to deal with. Um, this is what it looks like from software. We provide a macro, so it's not, we don't alter the RISC-V tool chain at all. So we simply use a macro that uses inline assembly. And this is the, the most primitive version of it where we give the 10 bits explicitly as func3 and func7 fields, they must be compile time constants. And then the two actual operands, 32 bits each, they're just C variables and uh, GCC takes care of the rest, the, the rest. Now, yeah, let me show you an example. We have, uh, here's four instructions where we do a, a load from memory, feed that, into a one custom instruction, then the result of that goes into a second custom instruction, and then we store the result back to memory. And after we compile it and then disassemble it, we simply see the four assembly instructions with no extra overhead for copying register to register. We, again, since we don't alter the uh, RISC-V tool chain at all, the disassembler doesn't actually know anything at all about the CFU instructions. So we wrote a little script to patch it up afterwards to replace the hexadecimal with the CFU mnemonic, uh, the sub functions and the register sources and destinations. Okay, um, we use a, a version of TensorFlow that's made especially for lightweight, uh, tiny ML at the edge. It, uh, is really streamlined and it fits into kilobytes. I mean, hundreds of kilobytes, but still less than megabytes. Uh, and it's compatible with bare metal environments. You don't need virtual memory or malloc. It, the, the memory space for the, the, ten, the all the tensor storage is pre-allocated. Um, typically you would train your model in a data center or on a big computer in TensorFlow and then export it to TF Lite. And the, the TensorFlow Lite model is the input to TF Lite for microcontrollers. So the microcontrollers part just means the runtime itself is a very uh, streamlined, stripped down and straightforward. And the model that you're using is actually compiled right into the executable. So then that means you don't even have to worry about the file system, how you go out and read in the model because the model's already in your binary. Uh, so again, the runtime is very simpler, simple. You have an interpreter that walks over the graph in memory. And when it sees a convolution, it simply dispatches to the routine for doing convolution, passing it the pointers for the input and output uh, tensor buffers. Uh, so when I say kernel, that means the actual code that does the computation to implement that TensorFlow operation. And the thing about, the feature of TF Lite for microcontrollers that we use is you can override the kernel for to provide an architecture specific uh, implementation. So there already exists an application uh, version of the convolution kernel that was written especially for Extensa embedded architectures, another one for ARM architectures. And we're going to use this mechanism to write your own version of the kernel for the CPU that you're developing. And again, the key thing is there's no compiler alteration at all. Uh, it's just not part of this project. 
uh, graphically. So here's a very simple picture of the TF flight model. See convolution, deathwise convolution. So each time it encounters a convolution, it dispatches to the, convo the general convolution routine. But within that, you can say, oh, wait, I have a specialized version for a one by one by one version of the convolution. So if I see that, I'm going to dispatch to this even more specialized version. Um, OK, so let's look at what play CFU Playground actually is. Uh, first of all, it builds all the gateware for you. Uh, because the soft CPU sitting in the middle of an FPGA can't really do much. So we use Litex to build the SOC around it, provides IOs, it abstracts away a lot of all the details you need for interacting with a certain board. For example, which pins on the FPGA connect to which features on the board? How? Where's my UART? Where's my memory? Uh, Litex really takes care of all of that for you. Um, so graphically, all the stuff in blue is taken care of by Litex. Uh, we don't, you don't need to know which pins connect to DDR or the serial port or flash memory or ethernet. The only thing you provide is the custom function unit. Okay, so what boards are supported? We started supporting only the Digilent RD35T board, which is uh, a great educational tool. It has enough LUTs, you know, more than enough LUTs, for what we were using it for. It has 256 megabytes of memory, which is way more than we need. But we're really interested in tiny ML. So the this is new since uh, just in the last couple of weeks, we now support potentially 48 uh, FPGA boards, uh, ranging in size from larger and to much smaller than the RD board. Of course, you're still limited by the available resources on the board. So the initial build of CFU Playground might not fit on that board, but then you can you can try to minimize the software and or hardware. Um, also, you don't even need the physical board because we can run it in Renode, which is an emulation platform, uh, also from Ant Micro. And speaking of going tiny, our next project, are actually in flight and almost ready to land, is putting CFU Playground on FOMO, which is this little FPGA board that fits in your USB slot. And I have to give credit to our intern this summer, uh, Joey. And so this is all Joey's work. Uh, the FOMO is very small, uh, about 5,000 logic cells, 128 kilobytes of RAM uh, on the FPGA and then a two megabyte flash next to it. And it all fits on that little board. So Joey is, is trying to optimize the VEX risk so that it fits, but still gives good performance, but still leaves extra logic for you to implement your uh, custom function unit. And so some of the tweaks is that, okay, we need a multiplier, but we don't really need a divider. so. That led to some issues to how to get that. Um, he shortened the, the CPU pipeline, and he's playing around with either having a small iCache because executing code out of RAM is much faster than out of flash, or how to partition the code. And uh, by hand, say, I want this code to live in RAM because I know it's gonna, I'm going to use it a lot. So we're investigating which is better, the iCache or the um, manual splitting. Um, if you worked with FOMA, you know the workflow is a little quite different than RD or some other FPGA boards. So Joey's enabled uh, FOMA's specific workflow in CFU Playground. And um, hopefully that will land by the end of his internship. Okay, so with the gateway, the main, the main thing is you only have to worry about providing the custom function unit and CFU Playground builds the rest. Okay, on the software side, we also provide the entire executable, including multiple models, uh, unit tests, micro benchmarking, and it just works right away. And then you are free to start overriding parts of it for when you start developing your own custom function unit. We use a overlay approach where we start with the 
upstream TensorFlow Lite Micro and our own code that we provide, you in your project start with nothing, but then when you wanna start overriding either parts of TensorFlow to use your custom function unit or add your own tests, then you put it in your project. And it works like this. First, we copy the standard stuff into your build directory, and then anything that exists in your project overwrites what's already in the build directory, and then we build it and put it on the FPGA board. Okay, so this is what the build looks like. You CD into your project just by being in that directory, the build system knows that that's the project you're working on. Make prog builds the bitstream um, on Arty using Vivado. It takes about three and a half minutes to build uh, from completely clean. The entire software takes less than a minute. And you might be thinking, wait, I, I built TensorFlow before. How can you build TensorFlow in less than a minute? And the, the thing is, we're not building all of TensorFlow. We're just building the code for TensorFlow like micro. So the entire thing end to end is less than five minutes and then is running on your board, ready for you to interact with. The steps that you as a user would take, you know, after you clone and do the setup is copy a template project to be your project, uh, choose which model you're gonna work on, run it through the binary, it does profiling. It'll tell you how many millions of cycles each layer is taking. Then you decide which to go in and try to optimize. You start looking at the code, look for optimized cases for specialization based on the parameters and tensor shapes of your exact model. And then you start looking for custom function unit opportunities. Measure the speed up and repeat. Um, we do support many versions of debugging depending on uh, and performance uh, analysis, depending on exactly what you're interested in. Uh, there's software emulation of the CP, the custom function unit. That is, you write the C subroutine that does what your custom function unit would do. So kind of a, a subroutine in place of your custom instruction. And this simply is good for doing a unit test, comparing them side by side, your implementation versus the actual hardware implementation. And it's also used for just checking your algorithm restructuring. Once you modify TensorFlow to use your custom instruction, did you make a mistake there? We used Renode for doing the RISC-V simulation, and you can extend it to understand your new custom instructions, um, that, but that's an extra step for you as the de developer. Uh, it's, but it's really useful for us to use Renode in continuous integration. So we test all 48 of those boards whenever there's a pull request on our, our GitHub repository. Um, there's Verilator for doing a the cycle accurate Verilog level simulation of, of the CPU and CFU. It is It will check how that your Verilog implementation of your custom function unit is correct. And maybe even more useful is checking the handshaking between the CPU and CFU because since you're implementing the handshaking on the CFU side, it's somewhat easy to make a mistake the first time you do it. And you can get waveforms, it makes it really easy for debugging. Unfortunately, you can't use this for actual performance measurement because it has an idealized version of the memory and you really need to take into account memory latency when you're really concerned about performance. Um, there is also a debug bridge that you can attach to the live system running on the FPGA board. Uh, just we, we haven't heavily used that ourselves, so it's not uh, fully tested. Probably the most exciting uh, version is in the works where we take Renode for simulating the RISC-V processor very quickly, and then Verilator code that does the simulation of just your custom function unit. So that's kind of the best of both worlds to speed up uh, so that we don't need to do a gate level simulation of the CPU, only your, your added functionality. Okay, examples, this is probably where it's easiest to understand it. Okay, we we're looking at uh, uh, person detection algorithm. This is straight out of the TensorFlow micro examples. And we find that convolution 2D takes up uh, most of the runtime. So we look at the kernel. 
So this is a typical machine learning loop nest where the outer layers are iterating over the out, the each data element in the output tensor. And then to calculate each of those, we iterate over the input tensor and the filter values. And so, okay, let's, let's figure out a new custom instruction. Down here we have, in the innermost loop, we have a kind of a multiply accumulate. We actually add an offset then do a multiply and then accumulate it. So, okay, that'll be our, our new custom instruction. It's gonna look kind of like this in hardware. Oh, well, you, you might say, wait, you can't do that in um, a two operand instruction because there's actually four operands. There's the old previous value of the accumulator, filter val, there's input val and input offset. But the thing is, Input offset is loop invariant, so we can move that into the custom function unit before we start the inner, the loop uh, computation. So that'll be one instruction to initialize input offset, another instruction to clear the accumulator, and the accumulator will also live in the custom function unit so that we don't have to keep moving it back and forth between the CPU and the custom function unit. And this is how the software looks after we modify it to use the custom function unit. Uh, again, we, we once we know the input offset, we move it into the CFU using our first custom instruction. Then we use a second custom instruction to zero out the accumulator. And then the, the main new instruction will do We'll send it the two operands and tell it, okay, here's the new data. Do your computation and accumulate it into your accumulator. And finally, when we're done with the innermost loop nest, we can pull out the final version of the accumulator. So I, I broke it down into four different instructions. If you were wanting to be tricky, you could probably reduce it to two instructions by kind of, yeah. Oh, and that might, that was a little hard to like you, it was up to you, the user to remember, okay, which is instruction zero, which is one, which is two, which is three. So we actually recommend that you just do uh, another macro, another pound define to give your instructions meaningful names. So this is what it would look like after we, we after we use our, our macros. So now we have CFU in at offset, CFU clear accumulator, CFU Mac with offset. And finally to get the, accumulator back out, we use CFU get accumulator. Okay, um, so usually you start with something like that and then it quickly starts growing over time as you try to figure out how to get more performance. And many of you are probably already thinking, well, let's go SIMD because these are actually 8-bit values. Why don't we just grab 32-bit chunks, send them out to the custom function unit, let it unpack and do the operations in parallel. And this is the kind of stuff that FPGAs are great at doing. And then you, you notice the filter values, well, they're kind of small and they're constant. Why don't we just park them in the custom function unit? And then that means we can move two 32-bit versions of the inputs each cycle. So we can double our computational rate. And from there, we keep going, add uh, stores for both input valves and filter valves, inc increase the parallelism, add a sequencer for doing the complete inner loop kind of on its own, um, do the post-processing on the accumulated value, the scaling and offset uh, and act activation function. And by the time we get to that point, then we're just kind of moving in, streaming big chunks in and pulling big chunks out, and we start double buffering it. And it ends up looking like this. So yeah, now it, you know, you might say this doesn't look like a custom instruction. You know, I was think you're thinking like popcorn. This looks more like a coprocessor, and you're just using the custom instructions to interact with your coprocessor. And I would say yes, you're completely right. Um, so here's where we're kind of abusing the CFU interface, uh, but you'll see it actually um, it works and we get pretty good performance, even though as this picture kind of shows, the CPU is standing in between 
the memory and the custom function unit for every single interaction. So this is the type of output you would get the first time you run your model through CFU Playground. You get this breakdown and you, <clears throat> well, not exactly this, you would, they, but you would, you, we see that we spent a lot of time on convolution and then you'd go in and say, oh, actually there's two kinds of convolution and a lot of time is spent on the one by one convolution. And then you would focus on that. And so that's what our, our first big custom function unit slash coprocessor looks like. And again, here's the iterative steps starting from no CFU. This is showing the bars show the resources on the FPGA for just the VexRisk CPU. It uses about half the block memories for caches, uh, less, maybe only a third of the LUTs and not many of the multiplier units. And as we iterate, the performance, the blue line increases. Now this is a factor speed up, so not percent, but uh, 10 times speed up, 20 times speed up on, on just this operation, not on the overall application. So by the end, there's two things to notice. We get a 55 times speed up, which is pretty good. And without a whole lot of growth in the, the FPGA resources. So it's not that we've thrown a whole lot of computational resources at it. We're just uh, doing things smart where we're kind of, that the FPGA can do better than the risk five instructions. So now we've reduced the 560 million cycles to 10 million cycles. But now there's other operations that are now taking up the majority of the time. So that would be the next step. And we actually, that's this is where we are. We've only sped up the one and not the other ones because we, we haven't actually finalized the model. And this is for an actual internal Google project. Um, oh, I hope I haven't gone too long. So wrap up. Um, Stuff we've gotten done recently, we've added the MLPerf tiny benchmarks. We've supported a, a lot more FPGA boards now. Um, everyone is always asking, well, can you add, can I please have a backdoor to DMA? And well, we, we haven't decided if we actually wanna add another path to memory from this CPU or whether to just add support for a separate bus-based accelerator. Um, and we're gauging interest in a half-day workshop. Uh, oh, and I just wanted to mention the, the interface that we're using is from the RISC-V International Soft CPU and Custom Function Unit Special Interest Group. And they are looking at doing all the hard stuff that I'm punting on for now. That is, how do you exchange custom function units with others? Do you need metadata? Uh, does the C PU need to know about the custom function units that are attached to it. Uh, what if you get multiple custom function units from different vendors and they were all thought they were gonna, they're all using the same opcode space. How do you remap the opcode space? Uh, what does the operating system need to do when it preempts a process and there's a stateful custom function unit? So the goal is push button composability efficiently supporting everything from bare metal systems up to multi-core Linux uh, virtual memory systems. And I list the members at the bottom. And more acknowledgments. Um, of course, I didn't do all this alone. Uh, my partner, Alan Green, is as the primary user of CFU Playground, has done a lot of the work, well, all the work developing the custom function units and a lot of the work also developing the infrastructure. Um, other Googlers, David Lattimore, Dan Callahan, my manager, Tim Anzel, who's kind of the godfather of this whole project, our interns, Rachel Segrono and Joey Bushgar now, and the TensorFlow Lite Micro team. Um, and Micro has done a ton of work with us, so thank you very much. And of course, the whole open source community, uh, especially VexRisk and Litex. And, but, you know, just everything from SimpleFlow, MeGen, Greenode, Verilator, OpenOCD, you know, it's just all the way down is open source. So thank you. And so 
please come and join us. Um, don't you think it'd be fun to design your own processor? Uh, the end. Tim, thank you very much indeed. Um, you already know this is a project that I'm very interested in and in another universe, I would have enough time to spend serious time hacking on this. I have a question for you and then uh, if anyone else has got questions, please just open up your camera and microphone and ask them or if you prefer, put them in the text chat and we'll ask them for you. So Tim, um, as you know, I'm involved with the Core 5 project and in particular the CVX IF interface which is sort of trying to sell, solve a, a similar problem of making it really easy to extend uh, risk five. And do you see that just as another solution or a more specific solution? Because it's very definitely tied to one core. Or is it something where you could actually meld the two projects together? Mm. Well, um yeah, I mean, in some sense, there might we might end up have there might be competing specs that decide to do things differently. Um, but the nice thing about, especially when you're working in the soft CPU domain, VexRisk could easily support both the CFU interface that it currently has, but it could also add support for CX CVX interface, and that could just be an option when you build your VexRisk. You decide which CFU interface you want. Um, but however, I mean, having a standard interface is useful for when you want to start exchanging things with other people. Um, I, I think we'll have to see how it plays out if there is some convergence of a single CFU interface. Um, and so in, I can talk a little more about the interface that we actually define multiple levels, like there's from level zero up to level five and you, that each level has more complexity and lets you support more complicated situations of whether you have multiple custom function units, whether there's state, uh, the, the details of the handshaking. Um, for example, if you only have a, a, if you're only adding a single cycle custom function unit, then things can be a lot simpler on the CPU side. Um, but um, I'm not, I, I think we can, yeah, let, let's uh, just keep in touch and exchange ideas. And I, I, I think we'll just need to see where it goes. Um, I think the, I guess one thing is in our discussion with the RISC-V International is they don't want to basically fix anything related to the custom opcode space. So they're kind of like, oh, you're on your own. We're not gonna ratify or bless any certain way of using custom instructions. Uh, which is fine. Other groups can do that, of which Open Hardware Group and Core 5 is one. You guys are another. And I agree. If we end up converging, because you know I know the work we're doing on uh, AI acceleration, and it'd be great if actually we could say, well, you try ours and we'll try yours. Um, and that would be a wonderful place to be. Uh, I agree. There we are. Okay, but we'll keep on talking. It's a it's a community where we do know each other and talk, so that's good. And uh, you have a question from Akash Tiagi, and I probably mangled that name. Um, can you read that there, Tim? Tim, have you got the chat? Right. Sure. Sure. How do we profile performance in terms of the number of cycles per operations in the CFU playground? Well, it's a combination of two things. We uh, our VexRisk implementation does have the M cycle register, which is just a free running counter, a 64 bit counter that is always incrementing no matter what the CPU is doing, whether the CPU is stalled or not. So it gives you a 100% accurate count of how many cycles have elapsed. And that is used by some profiling that was already built into TensorFlow Lite Micro that simply gets the the current cycle count at the, at the start of an operation and at the end, and then it records it. And um, the way it's set up now is it just sends it to standard output, and then we have a little bit of a script to post-process that and count all, all the operations of each type to give you the summary that I showed. So you know that, okay, there were 10 convolutions and added together, they're 500 million cycles. Um, so 
it is based on the M cycle counter that's built into your VEX risk and then code that's already in our infrastructure. So you don't have to add anything to do this profiling. Well, Cash, I hope that's answered that question for you. Um, there are no more questions. Thank you very much, Tim. I'm delighted to have had that presentation. Very much uh, appreciated.